Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back for another Game of Thrones video. I am very excited to be able to bring all of you this video because today I will be discussing something that has fascinated me ever since I was made aware of it many years ago. In this video, we will take an inside look at the disastrous original unaired pilot episode of Game of Thrones. Now, this is something I have discussed before, but new information continues to get released now that Game of Thrones is over. I do, however, realize that some of you may think the info is boring, but I am always very interested in learning any new details about this mysterious first episode. For those of you that might not know, Game of Thrones was actually very close to getting cancelled before it ever became an official series on HBO. Now, according to legend, the original, unaired first episode looks nothing like the first episode we saw nearly a decade ago. For many years, we have heard about some of the issues Dan and Dave had when they were making this first episode. It was so bad, only a handful of their friends and executives from HBO have seen it. I've been hearing about this episode for so long, I would gladly hand over a large amount of money just to be able to get a glimpse of this thing. I bet it is fantastic, in the worst kind of ways. Unfortunately, we may never actually see this episode on film, but thankfully some new information has been brought to light, thanks to James Hibbard at Entertainment Weekly. James is actually releasing a book titled, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. Game of Thrones and the official untold story of the epic series. James does seem to have a great relationship with everyone at HBO who worked on Game of Thrones because he always had the behind the scenes exclusives right before every new season would air. One day, I hope he's able to get us the entire episode because like I said, I am dying to watch it. But for now, let me show you some of the new details that will be included in his new book. This will be the first ever behind the scenes account of what happened during the making of Game of Thrones from start to finish. Alright, so the article from Entertainment Weekly says, The following picks up midway through the original pilot's production in 2009. First time showrunners David Benioff and Dan Weiss had struggled for four years to get their fantasy series off the ground. There had been an endless number of meetings, rewrites, negotiations, and hiring decisions. It was frightening because it was our first time running a production of any scale, Weiss recalls. And there are many, many moving parts, human and otherwise, that go into any production, especially one of this size. Finally, the cameras were rolling in Northern Ireland and Morocco. But even the production's most experienced members had never worked on a TV series as ambitious as what Thrones was attempting. And some of the veteran actors were getting the sense that not all was well in Westeros. Now, one of the things that I always thought was crazy was that HBO allowed Dan and Dave to run this show. They have even said as much themselves. They had very little experience at all, so the fact that they were given the reins to handle something of this size seems absolutely insane. Now, although I do love the first episode they gave us, this may have been the foreshadowing for what would happen at the end of the series when they would no longer have any source material to draw from. Alright, so now I want to get into some of the things I have never heard before. The actor, Mark Addy, also known as Robert Baratheon, said, We were trying to establish the rules and order of this new world. In the Winterfell Courtyard scene, nobody kneeled when the king arrived in the first pilot. You can't play being the king. You can't display, look at how powerful I am. People have to give you that by showing subservience. It has to be afforded to you by others. In the reshoot, everybody kneeled. It made a huge difference in terms of establishing who's in charge. The actress, Lena Headey, also known as Cersei Lannister, said, I was looking like a Vegas showgirl in the original episode. I was wearing furs and massive hair, like a medieval Dolly Parton. Now, if you go back and read the book, it says Ned Stark kneels down, and he even kisses Cersei Lannister's ring during Robert Baratheon's arrival scene in the first episode. I have no idea why they thought it would be a good idea not to have anyone kneel when the king is arriving in Winterfell out of the blue. It is amazing, though, how those small changes can make such big differences. And when it comes to Cersei looking like a medieval country singer, that just sounds hilarious. I would love to see at least a photo of how she looked during her original scene. Now, there is actually a photo of George R. R. Martin from the first episode, and by the looks of him, you can get a sense for how ridiculous some of the characters must have looked in that original episode. For those of you that don't know, George R. R. Martin was an extra during Danny's wedding scene, but it was ultimately cut out of the episode as well. 
as crazy as he may look, at least he does look like he's having fun. Let's look at what else was said. This was said by Brian Cogman, who started out as just an assistant on the show, but later became one of the writers, and he actually wrote one of the better episodes in the final season. Brian said, When we first shot the scene where the Starks find the direwolves, this was the version you never saw. The wonder of what a direwolf was wasn't coming across. It did not seem important enough to the characters, and I'm little assistant Brian running around the set yelling to anyone who would listen. These are direwolves. No one has seen these in a million years. This is like seeing dinosaurs. It's not like finding puppies. And everyone's sort of chuckling. Now, this is one of the things that did annoy me when I first read it. The fact that the actors were not taking this scene very serious is just a reflection of what sort of environment they were working in. Now, I don't know who was in charge on this day. I don't know if George R. R. Martin was there, or Dan and Dave, or only the director. But they have to lead by example. How can the actors take things seriously if no one else there is? You know, it's kind of sad that Brian Cogman, who was only an assistant at that time, has to explain to everyone how significant this moment in the story is. You would think there would have been side notes on each of their scripts letting them know, hey, the Starks finding these direwolves is sort of a big deal, so you might want to, you know, act like it. Let's look at some of the other ridiculousness. The actor, Harry Lloyd, also known as Danny's brother Viserys, said, I had a different wig. It was titanium and silver, and it was shorter and a bob. Looking back, it was a mistake. Yeah, no kidding. For those of you that don't know what this would look like, if you take a look at the screen, I will show you what a bob-style haircut looks like. Can you imagine Viserys wearing a wig that looks like that? There would be no way I could look at him during a scene without busting out laughing. Thank God they decided to change it to longer hair. That would have been horrific. The actor Ian Glenn, also known as Jorah Mormont, said this, It was a bit ragged and, in some ways, ill-conceived, and no one had great conviction. Since the wedding was shot at night, quite a lot of money had been spent on seeing absolutely F all. Well, this certainly would not be the first time he has been in a very expensive episode that was shot at night that resulted in them not being able to see anything at all. Now, I wonder what episode I'm referring to. I forgot to mention, when we see Danny's wedding in the show, it's during the day. But in the original first episode, they had shot all those scenes at night. George R. R. Martin said, There are a couple of stories. As a wedding gift, Khal Drogo gives Daenerys a silver horse and she rides away. For a moment, you think she's fleeing. Then she turns the horse around and leaps the horse over a big campfire. Drogo is very impressed, and it starts the relationship on a good note. We tried to film that scene. We got a top stunt rider and a top horse, a silver filly, but the filly would not jump that campfire. She got close and then was like, there's fire there, and would turn the other way. We tried to film it a half dozen ways. So the director goes, let's put out the fire and we'll do the fire with CGI. They put out the fire and the horse would still not jump the dead fire. It's a smart horse. It may not be burning now, but it was burning a little while ago. So they had to scrap that sequence, which was unfortunate, as it was a bonding moment between Danny and Khal Drogo. Now, you would think they would have gotten another horse and attempted this on another day, when the fire was completely out. Regardless of all the issues they did have, I still think the first episode they gave us was amazing. However, it is definitely unfortunate when they have to cut out scenes like this, because it's these little nuances that make this story so great. As you all know, the Dothraki have a very close relationship with their horses. Now, maybe not as much as the Starks do with their direwolves, or the Targaryens do with their dragons, but a very close relationship nonetheless. It would have been great to see Daenerys do this in front of all the Dothraki men, especially when you consider how young Daenerys was, and the fact that she did not have a lot of experience riding horses. We would have been able to see Khal Drogo admire her for having the courage to do this in front of everyone there. Now, if you remember Danny and Drogo's first sex scene, then you will remember how Daenerys did not give him consent. Well, that's not how it happened in the books, and that's not how it happened in the original first episode. In the original scene, they were using another actress as Daenerys Targaryen, and their scene followed more closely to the book. George R. R. Martin said their original scene was a seduction. Danny and Drogo don't have the same language. Danny is a little scared, but also a little excited and Drogo is being more considerate. I'm not sure why they decided to change this. 
They obviously had to reshoot this scene because now they had Amelia Clark as Daenerys, but they should have done it the same way George R. R. Martin intended it to be. Now I want to show you what happened when Dan and Dave showed some of their family members the original episode. This was before they made any changes. They wanted to see what others would think of it, and I will tell you now, it did not go well. David Benioff said, I showed it to my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and just sat back and watched their reactions. You could tell by watching their faces that they were bored. It wasn't anything they said. They were trying to be nice. Dan Weiss said, You listen to how sharply the pitch of somebody's voice turns up when they tell you it's good. It's good? How much higher than their average register is the word good? That's a gauge of how effed you are. Our good was in dog whistle territory. There were others who weren't trying to be nice but were actually trying to be helpful. Craig Mazin told us, you guys have a massive problem. Michael Lombardo, who also worked for HBO, said, There were some concerns about whether we were getting enough wide shots. Are we getting the coverage we need? We hired the best costume designer and the best art director and shot this in Northern Ireland and Morocco. Yet there was very little scope. I remember the quote was, We could have shot this in Burbank. Somebody else said, It looks like it was shot in my backyard. Now that's just sad. However, I do think they did a good job at fixing it, at least in the northern scenes. Another thing George R. R. Martin said was, The biggest thing was Dan and Dave called me up and had the idea of eliminating Rickon, the youngest of the Stark children, because he didn't do much in the first book. I said I had important plans for him, so they kept him. One confusing aspect wasn't entirely the filmmaker's fault. They could not afford to stage any King's Landing scenes, which more firmly established the Lannister family in the reshoot. But the dialogue didn't help either. The shocking punch of Jamie shoving Bran out the window seemed nonsensical, as viewers did not realize that Jamie and Cersei were sibling lovers trying to protect their treasonous secret. The producers tried to help explain the show's backstory by adding at least one flashback of Ned Stark's father and brother being killed by the Mad King. But that idea was later scrapped as well because it just seemed to add to the narrative muddiness. Now you can actually see some shots from that scene. I have seen some of the images of Ned Stark's brother, Brandon Stark, laying on the floor of the Red Keep. I believe some of that scene was included in the DVD extras of the first season or maybe some of the history and lore. I can't remember exactly. I want to show you one more thing before I end the video. Let me show you what Dan and Dave said they did to help get themselves a second chance at making the episode before HBO decides to cancel the series before it even began. Dan Weiss said, We had done a lot of soul searching. The one thing I think we did right is we owned all the mistakes. We did not point fingers. We said, we know this isn't good, and here is what went wrong, and how we would do it differently next time. We just went down the line, and I think they got the sense that, which was honest, that we weren't coming in trying to explain why the bugs were features. We were all on the same page that where we want to be is many levels up from this. There was a lot of begging. I think what was clearly evident was that there was a show here. This is why you do a pilot episode, because you're looking at what works and what doesn't, and whether this thing has legs. Now, once certain things were fixed, this would be a story you can tell over many episodes that keeps moving, with characters that keep evolving, but not so fast that you run out of story. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold the F up. Let me read that last sentence to you one more time. Once certain things were fixed, this would be a story you can tell over many episodes that keeps moving, with characters that keep evolving, but not so fast that you run out of story. Why is it ending? Uh, I don't know. Ask Dave and Dan when they come through. Um, we could have gone to 11, 12, 13 seasons. You wanted it to keep going. Well, it, it, you know, if you've read my novels, you, you know there was enough material for, for more seasons. Uh, they made certain cuts 